Hello everyone, I am Dr. Chaitali Parekh, Consultant Musculoskeletal Interventional Radiologist practicing in Mumbai. Sonopass, one of the most awaited ultrasound conference, is going to happen from 6th to 8th January 2023 in Mumbai. And in this conference is one of a kind workshop which is on ultrasound guided interventions. The main highlight of the workshop is that it's a hands-on workshop. That is, all the delegates will get a chance to perform all the interventions on a phantom under the guidance of a tutor. This workshop is going to include all the interventions ranging from FNAC to various visceral and soft tissue biopsies, synovial biopsies and musculoskeletal interventions like injections, ganglion cyst fenestrations and calcific barbotage. So I hope all of you register for this workshop, learn all the interventions and perform these interventions with confidence in your day-to-day -day routine practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitusha, and thank you, Malini ma'am, for inviting me for this wonderful session. So with this, I'll just begin with the quiz directly. So first, let's begin with the lower limb. So this is the first quiz. So most of you have got it right. About 60 to 70 percent of them have answered this as an ACL tear. And this is uh, an injury pattern of the ACL tear. So this is the classical pivot shift injury pattern where you get an anterolateral femoral edema and a posterolateral tibial marrow edema. And along with that, on the medial side, what you get is a peripheral medial marrow edema along with the posterior medial tibial marrow edema. So just to give you a quick revision, um, this is a full thickness anterior cruciate ligament tear. This is a partial thickness ACL tear, and this is also a partial thickness ACL tear. Now, the catch in this is, in this particular patient, if you look at the eggshell, you'll find that these are the two bundles. So this is your anterior medial bundle and the posterior lateral bundle. This is a partial thickness tear, which is involving both the bundles. Whereas in this particular patient, it is only the posterior lateral bundle, which is toned the anterior medial bundle is intact. So the take home point, don't just look at only one uh, image that is on one plane. Please look at the injuries on all the three planes to get a better idea of the type of injury. And over here, you can see this is a osseous avulsion fracture at the tibial attachment of the ACL with a low grade injury towards the tibial attachment. And plus these injuries are also well picked up on an X-ray where you can see that this is the avulsed osseous fragment over here. And don't forget, whenever you see an ACL injury, there'll be a lot many injuries associated with it. Most of them are obvious, like a meniscal tear or a medial collateral ligament injury. The thing that you often miss would be a Sagan's fracture because it's a very small fracture. So you can see that this is a tiny anterolateral tibial plateau fracture, which is at the attachment of anterolateral ligament. And again, these fractures are better picked up on a X-ray. Similarly, you can have small fractures at the posterolateral corner. So again, these fractures will be better picked up on an X-ray. So make sure to look at the radiographs along with an MRI. Next question, which of the following is correct? Whether it is a medial meniscal tear, there is no meniscal tear. Maybe there is a tear. I don't know. Next question, please. So you have 10 seconds. So yes, there is a medial meniscal tear. So let's just look at it now. So this is nothing but a ramp lesion. Okay. Now ramp lesion is nothing, but it is a tear at the posterior medial menisco capsular junction. So you can see a discrete fluid signal that is extending up to the articular surface. When you correlate this on the axial images, you can find that this is the tear over here. So you can see that there is a fluid signal, which is going in a shape of a crescent. So this is nothing but a ramp lesion or a posterior medial menisco capsular junction tear. Just a quick revision on the tears. So here, you can see this is your horizontal tear. Okay. This is a longitudinal tear, which is nothing but a peripheral longitudinal tear commonly seen with uh, cruciate ligament injuries. And the third type of the basic tear is a radial tear. So this is nothing but the ghost meniscus sign. You can appreciate the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, but you cannot see the posterior horn. And when you look at the axial images, if you have an axial image that is cutting exactly through the level of the meniscus, you'll find that this is the tear in this region. So you can see the posterior root, you can see the posterior horn, and then there is a discrete gap between the two. And this gap corresponds to this section. So this is a radial tear. So you've got three basic types of tears, 
a horizontal tear, a longitudinal tear, and a radial tear. Next question: What is the diagnosis? Whether it's a bucket handle tear, horizontal tear, horizontal tear with a displaced lap, or a radial tear? The answer is it's a horizontal tear with a displaced flap. So here you will see this is a normal appearing lateral meniscus. If you, here you will see that the upper portion of the medial meniscus is well seen, whereas in the lower portion you will see that the meniscal fragment is missing. And when you scroll back and forth, you realize that at the level of the body you can see that the meniscal flap is going into the superior medial gutter. So whenever you see such a tear. Please keep an eye and look out for meniscal flaps which can be displaced either in the gutter. Common sites are in the superior or inferior gutter, adjacent to the posterior root attachment, or adjacent to the posterior cruciate ligaments. So these are the common sites where the meniscus flap tends to be displaced. Now again, another patient where you can see the anterior horn is very small. There is an oblique tear in the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, but the horn is somewhat maintained in size. But the anterior horn is very much attenuated. So again, when you see such a case, look out for a displaced meniscal flap. Often in chronic tears, you won't be able to see a flap, but in acute tears, you will see a flap. So here you can see in the this is the coronal image of the same patient at the level of the body, and you can see that there is a large flap which is going into the superior medial gutter. Same patient on the axial section, you can appreciate the flap. Now so about thirty-five percent of you mentioned it as a bucket handle tear. Bucket handle tear is a kind of a displaced flap tear, but it's a particular type of a flap tear. So what happens is there is a tear. It's actually a longitudinal tear and not a horizontal tear to begin with. It's a large longitudinal tear. So if you uh, imagine there is a tear at this level, and the inner part of the meniscus is going to just shift inside like a bucket. So it's something like this, and it just flips over like this. So that's a bucket handle tear. How to identify an MR? You will see a very small peripheral remnant at the level of the body and posterior horn, as well as anterior horn, and a meniscal fragment which is displaced in the intercondylar notch. So that is important. The fragment should be in the intercondylar notch, and the fragment will be communicating with the anterior and posterior root attachments. So this is what is a bucket handle tear. Next question: What is the diagnosis? Is there a medial meniscal tear, lateral femoral osteochondral defect? Lateral femoral osteomyelitis and lateral femoral subchondral fracture. Wow! So sixty-five percent of you have actually answered it as a lateral femoral subchondral fracture, and it is that. So you can see a lot of marrow edema in the femoral condyle, but the important finding is this thin linear. Hypotense signal, which is there in the subchondral region, the overlying articular cartilage is intact. So this could be more like a fatigue fracture or a stress fracture. But you can see this hypotense signal is something that you need to pick up. It can happen in osteoarthrosis as well, where there is a cartilage loss. Because of the cartilage loss, the underlying bone becomes weak, and the patient tends to develop a subchondral fracture. Even with an intact articular cartilage, if the bone is weak because of osteopenia and other reasons, patient can develop these subchondral fractures. So just don't label this as a marrow edema. It needs to be labeled as a subchondral fracture. Sometimes the subchondral fractures are very obvious. As you can see, there is a high grade, at least an intermediate grade chondral loss in this patient. Some of the cartilage is still there, and the patient is developing a medial femoral subchondral fracture. And there is a lot of marrow edema. Sometimes these subchondral fractures are very subtle. As you can see in this patient, again. There is a chondral wear in the medial femoral tibial compartment, and you can see a subtle hypotense signal, which is very much in continuity with the cortex. So, how to identify such subtle subchondral fractures is when you see a lot of marrow edema, which is out of proportion to just an osteoarthrosis. In those conditions, you need to look if there is any subchondral fracture. Sometimes it may not be seen, but often you'll find one. So, you need to uh, look for such subtle subchondral fractures as well. And the third is this patient. But you can see, this is more like a proximal tibial stress fracture. So it is not in the subchondral region. Yes, there is a high grade osteoarthrosis. The lateral compartment is good. You cannot appreciate any medial compartment cartilage. There is extrusion of the meniscus. But again, this fracture is not in the subchondral region. It is more like a proximal medial tibial stress fracture. Next question. Again, what is the diagnosis? Medial femoral AVN, 
medial femoral subchondral insufficiency fracture, osteochondritis desiccans, or osteomyelitis. Okay, most of you have got it right, which is osteochondritis desiccans. I'm very happy that none of you have mentioned it as a neurovascular necrosis because that's a very obvious finding and you don't see a geographic area of APN. And none of you have mentioned it as an osteomyelitis. So that's really good. Some of you have labeled it as a subchondral insufficiency fracture. Please remember, usually when you're labeling a subchondral insufficiency fracture, there should be a lot of marrow edema, at least mild to moderate marrow edema. Otherwise, you don't label it as a subchondral insufficiency fracture. So here, what you can see, this is the same patient. So you can see that there is a proper osteochondral defect. The other, the cartilage in the rest of the medial femur is good. The medial tibial cartilage is good. And when you come anteriorly, you actually see a osteochondral fragment. So again, on an X-ray, these such osteochondral fragments, if they are sizable ones, they'll be easily picked up on a radiograph. So often when you have a difficulty finding for an osteochondral fragment on an MR, because sometimes it's difficult to pick up bone on MR, such small osteochondral fragments, Please look at the x-rays. They will really help you to locate such osteochondral fragments. So this is obviously an unstable OCD with a displaced osteochondral fragment. This is a second patient where you can see that there is a proper OCD. So you can see this jet black line is the cortex. Above it, there's the cartilage. And there is a fragmentation of this osteochondral fragment. There is a proper fluid signal that is going between the osteochondral fragment and the underlying parent bone with subchondral cystic changes in the underlying parent bone. So this is an unstable OCD because there is a fluid signal that is going between it, but it is not displaced. So this is an unstable displaced OCD. This is an unstable but a non-displaced OCD. And this is a third patient where you don't see, you can see that there are changes of OCD which have begun, but there is no fluid signal. So this is still a stable OCD. So that's how we differentiate between the three. Next question. What is the likely injury in this patient? Is this edema pattern of an ACL tear or a PCL tear, patellar dislocation or MCL tear? Okay, at least 70% of you have got it right. So this is a patellar dislocation pattern. Some of you have mentioned the ACL and a PCL tear. Um, just remember, I know this is anterolateral femur. Yes, but... The difference between the two is, in case of an ACL injury, this is the region of sulcus terminalis, which is just anterior to the anterior horn of lateral meniscus. You will see edema pattern in the region of sulcus terminalis, whereas in case of patellar dislocation, the edema is mainly located on the anterior trochlea. Because what happens is when the patella dislocates, when it tries to come back, it hits against this anterior trochlea and comes back. And the second thing, why it is not an ACL or a PCL tear is you can obviously see the edema in the inferomedial patella. So when you put these two together, you know that this is a patella dislocation. Now, the things that you need to look out for besides diagnosing it as a patella dislocation, one is obviously you need to look for the medial patellofemoral ligament because what happens is your patella dislocates laterally and so the medial patellofemoral ligament is stretched and gets injured. So here you can see there is a high grade injury at the femoral attachment or as, as well as there is an intermediate grade injury at the patellar attachment and along with that you can see there is a small osseous fracture. So there is an avulsion fracture at the patellar attachment of the MPFL. The second thing that you need to look out for is the if you see any inferomedial chondral loss or a proper osteochondral defect. So this person, if you see, the cortex here is good. The cortex here is good. In this region, the cortex is missing and the overlying cartilage is missing. So in such cases, you need to keep an eye for an osteochondral defect. Why this is important? If it's an acute injury, a young patient, if you find the osteochondral fragment and it's a sizable one, the surgeon is going to put it back. Second thing, even if it's a small osteochondral fragment, if it's left inside in the joint, it will form a loose body, which can result into locking of the knee as well as early osteoarthrosis. So it needs to be taken out. For that, it is important that you need to tell the orthopod where exactly is the osteochondral fragment. So whenever you see these cases, such particular picture, please look at all the planes and try to find that osteochondral fragment. So here you can see this is the same patient, coronal image, and this osteochondral fragment was actually lying in the inferior medial gutter. So you need to look out for such things. 
easier way look at the radiographs they will really help you if provided it is not just a chondral flap sometimes we can get only a chondral flap for that you have to rely only on an mri but if it's an osteochondral fragment you can pick it up on an x ray as well and obviously your ct scans will also help you so here you had a very smaller osteochondral fragment this is a patient who had a sizable osteochondral fragment which was easily picked up even on an x ray right so whenever you see such x ray you know that one of the conditions in a young patient if they give you a history of patellar dislocation or a patellar instability you know that this is an osteochondral fragment which has been chipped off from either medial patella or lateral femur another thing that you need to look out in these patients is you need to calculate your tttg ratio and the second thing is you need to look at for the trochlear dysplasia so if you can see this particular patient actually has a trochlear dysplasia so all of these stuff need to go into your report